In China, the story of the cross once seemed as strange and as far away as the other side of the universe. But today, its message is here, right in our midst. During the Boxer Rebellion, 236 Western missionaries and 23,000 Chinese Christians were killed. In the following 50 years, more Western missionaries came to China. They established 19 universities, over 6,000 elementary schools and high schools, and more than 900 hospitals. The number of Chinese Christians grew to 700,000. The Chinese Communist Party believed this success was the result of imperialist cultural invasion. They expelled all Western missionaries, forced Chinese missionaries to renounce their religion and mandated a secular education for all Chinese. Fifty more years have passed and today there are approximately 70 million Christians in China, an increase of 100-fold. In the last 20 years, China has become a giant dragon soaring across the sky. This dragon cares for nothing but its own achievement. The startling material growth of the nation is mirrored only by the steep decline of morality and personal values. However, the whole country, from its leaders to its citizens, is ignoring its hollow moral core. In a single night at a casino in Burma, I lost 20 years of savings. I was greatly depressed when I went back to Guangzhou, my hometown. To ease my pain, my friends took me to the nightclubs. I thought I'd found relief, but this kind of relief didn't last long. When I came back to reality, I was in even deeper pain. That's when I sought out God. I browsed through all the bookstores for a copy of the Bible, but I didn't find any. One day, while having dinner with a friend, I told him I wanted to know about the Bible and Christianity. He told me he knew a Christian and made a phone call for me that night. The next day, I met with this Christian. He knelt down and prayed for me to accept Jesus. I quit smoking, drinking, marijuana, and popping ecstasy pills. Quitting these habits was such a hard struggle, but inside me I felt a source of strength that was helping me all the way. My belief has greatly changed my life. There was a time when I really wanted to get back all the money, the cars and the houses I'd lost. But now I'm a changed man. I still work hard, but that's not everything in my life. I go walking with my wife after dinner, and I spend time with my family. Studying the scriptures has become the greatest joy in my life.
My family has completely changed their opinion of me. He has changed so much. He loves me and cares about me more than ever. We're so grateful he has made so many good friends at church. Our family is truly blessed. I feel great. Jesus said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You have no idea how he was before. He was one of those so called gangsters, robbing, street fighting, and doing the worst things you can imagine. If a farm had plump chickens, he and his gang would steal them at night. They would break the necks of the chickens and eat them when they got home. If I saw a young girl I wanted, I would go straight to her mother and threaten her. He was always cursing. He never talked without swearing or picking a fight with somebody. He could never pass a young girl without feeding her up. Only God's power could change such a man. Shouldn't we be thankful to God? I believe in Jesus Christ, and today I would like to introduce the Lord to you. People in China know very little about Christianity. Many think of it as nothing more than a superstitious belief, or an unwelcome import from Western culture, or a social force. In reality, the birth of Christ has only one purpose. It is to redeem his people from sin. Today, the gospel is cleansing and purifying all the sins in the hearts of the Chinese people, like a clear spring of living water. I was a big time gangster. I owned a casino and I was a loan shark. Later, I became addicted to drugs and lost every penny I had. I tried to quit about 20 times. But I just couldn't. One day my mother said to me, Son, believe in Jesus. Kind of passively I said, Okay, Mom, I'll try. She took my hand and started praying, Jesus, my Lord, I thank you. Now my son has agreed to follow you. I have brought him before you. Please help me. I will give my life to you if you save him. I was deeply touched by her prayer. So I said, All right, I'd like to repent all my sins. In about a half hour, I fell asleep. When I got up the next morning, I felt a new strength inside of me. I had no idea where the strength had come from. Several years have gone by, and since that day, I've never gambled. I still don't know where that strength came from. It had to have come from Christ. While I was having dinner one day with some of the former police chiefs, I told them I needed to pray before eating. I told them how Christ had saved me. One of them said, it took that long? If you'd been saved earlier, we wouldn't have had all this chaos in our country. Why don't you bring your old buddies to Jesus? Please help them. I'll support you. I said, praise the Lord. Why don't you join us? I don't remember what we were looking up in the Bible at the time. All I remember was they asked me if I had any questions. I said, I don't know how to love. It was true. I couldn't understand what I wasn't loved when I tried so hard to love others. I was having trouble with my boyfriend. I was heartbroken, so I started going out with anybody who asked me. Yet I never felt loved. There were two Christian girls in my dorm. They asked me if I would accept the Lord. I agreed to try. And they said, let us learn about the love of God together. Historically, the concept of repentance has never been part of China's belief system. 
It's a completely revolutionary spiritual experience for Chinese people when they discover that we are all sinners and we have all fallen short of God's glory. What a miraculous change for a Chinese man or woman to finally admit they are sinners and need forgiveness and baptism from God. I used to be a drunk after I became a Christian. I quit smoking and drinking altogether. Sometimes when I fight with my wife, I feel like swearing. But somehow the curses just won't come out of my mouth anymore. The last time we fought, I lay in bed for two days and nights without eating or drinking water. I thought to myself, I might as well try to believe in Jesus. If it works, we'll spend the rest of our lives together. If not, I'll either divorce him or kill myself. It's been six years since we became Christians. Now we get along pretty well. A Christian doesn't swear, fight, steal, or rob. You can't live a good life without faith in God. The amazing thing is, that no matter who you are, whether you're a farmer, an intellectual, you're from a broken family, or live in the underbelly of society, you can live a new life once you come to Jesus. Sometimes I felt discouraged when I prayed about him. He didn't seem to change at all. In fact, I felt he was getting worse and worse. Paul said he was a sinner. Paul confessed to being a great sinner. I felt that I was too. In the unbearable lightness of being, Milan Kundera mentioned that there are two kinds of men. One finds the virtues of all women in one woman. The other finds the virtues of one woman in all women. I chose to be the latter. I fell into a deeper and deeper trap. I was a big sinner. Not only was I destroying the life of my faithful wife, but I was also deceiving myself, numbing my own conscience. But I still couldn't get out of the trap. I thought I could deal with all the affairs I was having at the same time, but it was really exhausting. Later on, I thought divorce might be a shortcut, a better way out. I kept screaming for a divorce, but I knew I didn't have the guts to do it. I had to endure all kinds of verbal abuse from him. But God gave me the strength of patience, the kind of patience I never had before I became a believer. When my husband attacked me, I just found a quiet corner and prayed. I asked God's help to change him. Before she found faith in Jesus, she always assumed that I was lying, even when I wasn't. After she became a Christian, she became very trusting. All I had to tell her was I needed to go out, and she'd say, all right. Gradually, I stopped lying to her because I didn't want to be unworthy of her trust. After I converted, I found peace within myself. There's nothing worth getting angry over. Sometimes I purposely tried to provoke a fight, but to my surprise, instead of fighting with me, she would go into the kitchen or the bathroom to pray. I said to myself, this is impossible. This girl doesn't have strength like that. When he got angry, I kept quiet. I prayed and I asked the Lord to calm him down. To my surprise, I saw the flame of his anger dimming, little by little, poof, then it died. I heard him sigh and then come over to comfort me. Ah, how grateful I was to the Lord. This was God's work. He was right there. When she prayed for me, she was often in tears. One day God told her, restrain your eyes from tears. He will return from the land of the enemy. April 10th, 1998. It was our wedding anniversary. 
That evening, she had a church gathering. I offered to drop her off because Beijing was dangerous at night. I thought I'd wait outside till the meeting was over, and then I'd escort her home. But I was brought inside immediately and seated at the very front. When we got home, I told my wife that I'd like to pray, but didn't know how. She took me to the bathroom, and we knelt down. She asked me to repent, so I did. She told me she'd never seen me crying out loud like that before. It was the first time I saw him cry and repent. At first he was sobbing, later he started crying out loud. I felt the sky had turned into a huge book in front of my eyes. After I repented for a sin recorded on a particular page, that page would be turned to the next one. I remembered things I'd long forgotten. It was miraculous. If I hadn't decided to follow Jesus Christ at that time, I might have ended up dead. I didn't realize what a new life we'd receive until we both accepted God. We're so grateful to the Lord. Really? Now we have a very good communication. She understands me and I understand her. We have become one, as God says. God is with us. It feels so good to come close to God together as husband and wife. I feel that she's not hard to talk to and she needs my love so much. And I feel that with her as the only woman to love in my life, I am complete. One time I told her I felt like we were falling in love all over again. God is full of wonder. He brought love into our home and saved us from the hands of Satan. Our life has gone back to the state of Eden. There is no deception. In the past, I hid my cell phone and beeper because I didn't want her to find out about all my love affairs. But now I can leave her my cell phone and beeper if I'm not available. I asked her to help me answer the calls and take care of my stuff. She has become my personal secretary, and I've become hers too. There are no secrets between us. We have become one, physically and spiritually. We may never understand why Christ's death on the cross has such tremendous power to revive our souls and our lives. But throughout history, this miracle has kept on happening, and the Chinese people in the 21st century are no exception. We didn't talk about divorce, but we were separated. Our marriage was in danger. When I was working in Shenzhen, my job made me feel very important. We were on the verge of divorce, and my family life felt meaningless. I felt that my parents were only together, out of convenience. I didn't see why we should stay together as a family. My wife decided to convert only after she saw the change in me. He asked me to go home and see the changes. I replied, what belief? You smoke and drink. You don't know how to love anyone. You are a lazy slob, and you never help around the house. I prayed for my parents, and the year I graduated, my parents finally got back together. He has never treated me so well. 
not since the day we got married. When I was young, I wasn't ugly. Actually, I was quite a pretty girl. But even back then, I wasn't able to change him. Now I'm old, and he's so nice to me. Five years ago, we had three cars, and now we have three bicycles instead. But I have no desire to go back to the life we had before. Although we only have bicycles, our life has completely changed. I was always the one who made tea for my husband. But now, when I wake up from my afternoon nap, a cup of oolong tea is always there. It's my favorite tea, and my husband makes it specially for me. If it weren't for God's power, this never would have happened. I didn't know whether this love comes from Jesus or from somebody else, but they really love me. It's a fact, an unchangeable fact. This orphan had spent most of his life wandering the streets. In 1999, he was adopted by a house church in Chengdu and later became a preacher. I left home when I was 12 and lived on the streets for four years. During that time, I got involved in tons of street fights. I have a lot of scars from those days. One day, I was stabbed in the back. I lost a lot of blood and had to be taken to the hospital. The church set up orphanages to adopt these homeless children who spent most of their lives wandering aimlessly through the streets and train stations. These children have been living on the street when we found them. They have picked up lots of bad habits. We love them with the pure love only Christ can give. And we taught them God's word. I see immediate changes in mischievous children soon after they join our big family. It's God's love that changes and renews the life of these children. I'm from India, Mongolia. My parents abandoned me because I was blind. After my parents were jailed, I was home alone, so I started to wander the streets. I ran away from home because my parents beat me. I felt that my mother hates me after my father died, so I took 20 yen and left home. Auntie Zhang found me and brought me here. My father died from an overdose of drugs. My mother ran off with somebody and remarried. She told everybody that I wasn't her son. My father saw my brothers, and he wanted to sell me too. He beat me, so I left home and picked pockets on the trains, in the streets, and just about everywhere I went. He was mute and deaf. At first, he was always hitting the other children here. Later on, he stopped hitting and started to help others. How old are you? Say four. Where are you from? Auntie Go and two other sisters found him when he was just a baby. I'd always felt inferior, but after I saw the selfless love of the teachers at the orphanage, I learned to love others. It's all because of the love of Jesus. Oh,
不得已也走遍全世界，把爱的种子播撒。These sisters receive no wages for their work, and they never have a vacation. They do this with no accolades or recognition from society. In fact, they have to do all of this secretly because it is a service of the house churches, which are illegal. But I know here is love. Well, I know the love of God is here. When I love others, I learn the greatness of love. Love is devotion and sacrifice. Love is sacred. In a world of selfishness, these faithful followers of Christ are willing to follow the example of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. We in China, in the world. Nowadays, what's missing in China is love, the universal love that comes from our Lord Jesus. Once we accept God's love, it will grow in everyone's heart and flow out continually like a living spring. God's love has brought peace into families. If more people believe in God, peace will spread out from family units into the whole of society. Today, humanity is the main problem of Chinese society. I think Chinese have lost the ability to love. This is very sad and dreadful. China's intellectuals have begun to discuss and pursue the love of Christ in their own unique way. Many consider me a harsh critic of our society. However, this is only one part of me. There is another part closer to my true self, such as love, pity, and compassion. Those qualities come from my understanding and study of the Bible and Christianity. Ninety-five percent of Americans say they believe in God, and I'm one of them. When President Bush talked about September 11th in his speech during his visit to China, he had tears in his eyes. The host of the meeting and also the students who were there should have expressed concern and compassion about the catastrophe. I'm sad to say that no questions or remarks were made. I believe they simply didn't feel the pain because they don't have God's love in their hearts. They can't feel others' pain as their own. All they cared about was the possible armed conflict between China and Taiwan. Freedom of religion is not something to be feared; it's to be welcomed, because faith gives us a moral core and teaches us to hold ourselves to high standards, to love, and to serve others. China's this God's love, this is an essential thing. It's important for an artist to spread God's love. Otherwise, his or her artwork will have no significance, despite the apparent aesthetic value. A good artist should bring a healthy and positive energy to his society. Wang Yongsheng, a well-known artist in China, once was falling deeper and deeper into a life of sin. I used to change girlfriends as often as I change clothes. Friends around me were all in similar situations. A lot of them were successful artists, but failures when it came to family. Here, Oh, I 
After watching China's confession, I finally realized what the Chinese people need. I also realized that my ignorance of love was pretty normal, given the circumstances I grew up in. I didn't have too much difficulty in becoming a Christian. After I watched China's confession, I read some books by Liu Xiaofeng. A missionary came to my house and talked to me for a while. I have been a Christian for only one year. I'm still an infant, really, but I pray every day. I also pray for my friends and look forward to meetings on Sunday. Most people in our group are artists. The group is called. Artists Fellowship. Every week we get together and talk with each other. I feel at home, very comfortable. It's really nice. Today, the love of God has brought us here. There's a song I can't sing well. How can I sing it well if it doesn't have God's love in it? It won't have any power of spiritual awakening. I used to own a bar. I got drunk every day, and I also used drugs for a while. I was numb about everything. Then I read in the Bible, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. I was deeply moved. I knew that I'd lost touch with my heart. Right about then, I met my wife in Beijing. In order to date her, I ended up in church because that's where she was. I was the only Christian in my class, and I started to spread the gospel among my classmates. Many of them also became Christians. Our attitude towards learning and working made a good impression on our teachers. I received the best dancer award in the national dancing contest. While I was waiting for my turn, I was praying quietly. I might have appeared odd to everybody else, but I didn't care. My attitude is different from before, though the trials and difficulties are still there. I feel joy all the time. The thought of God often brings tears to my eyes. They're not tears of pain, but tears of joy and peace. I think the world is cold, except for the love of God. I feel that God is holding my hand and walking with me, even in the dark. I never feel lost. I play mahjong every Friday and Saturday night. We stayed up all night playing. Sometimes there were so many people; the entire three floors of my house would be full. I lost ninety thousand yuan in six months. One day, a sister brought me to church. I'd never felt so good before. That night, I opened up and told them everything about me. I felt as if I was talking with my family. I wish I'd met God earlier. Words are not enough to express how deeply my heart was touched. <sighs> Many brothers and sisters often ask me how I became a Christian. In fact, God has been guiding me all the time. It came naturally. I didn't experience many ups and downs or go through much suffering. I'm in a profession where fame and wealth are the top priorities, not to mention all kinds of dirty tricks and sins. Thank God, chosen me, bringing me to a clean place. 
and allowing me to be in contact with decent people. Of course, our thoughts are not always clean. <laughs> Even now, I'm still troubled by distracting thoughts. I'm sometimes weak and self-centered. I don't follow God's word all the time. I have a strong personality, but I know I'm still a child of God. It's not that you don't leave Him; it's He who doesn't leave you. He's always there to help me get back on my feet when I trip and fall. 对，哎，太好了，李东宝，点着名找你。嗯，四十岁了。Nothing should be new for a 40-year-old, because I have experienced so much in life. But for me, somehow everything is always fresh. I wonder why I'm like this, why I'm so easily moved. When I need passion in my acting, the passion comes out fully. Before I act, I usually pray. It's because of God's love that my heart is touched so easily. For more than six months, he would go to church every Sunday and argue about whether God existed. I realized faith was a move I had to make on my own. It's like a person who hears from others that an apple tastes good. If he keeps on analyzing its composition without taking a bite, he or she will never know the truth. Taste of an apple. So I told myself, just believe it. I went to one of the best high schools in China, Nankai High School in Tianjin. After that, I went to one of the top universities in China, Tsinghua University. Because of my academic success, I was really big-headed. I love to ask tough or unusual questions. It's called reasoning, but really, it's sophistry. One thing that greatly influenced my decision to become a Christian was my first prayer. Before I opened my mouth, I felt very uncomfortable. Once I started, somehow I calmed down right away. My questions didn't bother me anymore. They weren't resolved, but I stopped thinking about them. I became a very happy person. My wife and I joined the gospel meetings around the same time, and we accepted the Lord at the same time too. Every night we study the scriptures together. We take turns reading them aloud and then pray together. Physics is an experimental science. I felt I had to meet God before I could believe in Him. One day, a sister told me, "Actually, you may try praying to God when you have problems." So I did this a few times, and God did listen. Since the May Fourth Movement of 1911. Reason and science have had supreme status among Chinese intellectuals. What kinds of questions do Christian scholars think about? Everybody knows one plus one equals two. It's a self-evident truth. No mathematician would try to prove it. It's the premise on which other mathematical theorems are based. When I first got to know God, like many others, I constantly tried to prove God's existence. Now I know what I did was meaningless. God's existence is not something that can be proved by human reasoning. As physicists, we try to synthesize asymmetrical molecules for medical and scientific purposes. Our achievements are minute compared with God's creation. 
The more one works in scientific fields, the more ought one has of the Creator's wisdom. Many Chinese intellectuals are presently studying Christian philosophy and belief. However, the essence of faith is not theory, but a way of new life. God is not found through reasoning, but in spirit and in truth. Why do we live? Do we really disappear after we die? I felt very troubled when I thought about life and death. So I went to worship Buddha to find an answer, but nothing ever happened. One day I felt compelled to visit the local church. It wasn't Sunday, it was Tuesday. The door was locked, but they allowed me to go inside and stay for a while. While sitting there, somehow I felt very moved. Not knowing why, I started to cry. I sat there alone and cried for about an hour. A Christian couple visited us and took us to church. During the church meeting, my sister and I both cried uncontrollably. Tears were streaming down our cheeks. We didn't know why we were so moved. It was like suddenly we saw light. It shone through our hearts. As a seedling craves water and sunshine in order to thrive, so does the soul long for the pure love of Christ in order to flourish. Why are you here to celebrate Christmas? Because I want to receive peace and Christmas blessings. Because I'm waiting for Christ. I have to see Him today. Are you sure you'll see Him when you go in? Absolutely, as long as you believe in Him. I think Christianity is a symbol of peace. It's beautiful. Do we all long for peace? I come here often to pray for world peace. I wouldn't be this good if I wasn't Christian. If everybody becomes Christian, our country will definitely be much better off. The churches in Beijing are overwhelmed with people, not only on Christmas Eve, but each and every Sunday throughout the year. Since the establishment of the People's Republic of China more than 50 years ago, the size of the Christian population in Beijing has grown from the tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. However, the number of chapels has diminished from 66 to 6. Chinese people educated under the ideology of materialism may be confused by the spiritual thirst they are feeling. Their souls are longing for a spiritual awakening. I felt some time was missing at the bottom of my heart, even though I was working at a preschool. In people's eyes, it was a very good place to work. When I first worked there, Miss Chan, one of my co-workers, told me that my previous job at the chicken farm was actually a better choice. It was easier to deal with chickens than with people. After a while, I realized I may have chosen the wrong place to work because I really didn't know how to play politics. I made good money, but I felt exhausted. I told my husband that I wanted to find a place to cry out loud. He loves to tease me. He said to me jokingly, you must be sorry you marry me. I told him I didn't know why I felt so upset. I cried hard that night. The next day, I went to Miss Chan, who told me about the gospel. I started to cry as soon as I saw her. At first, she thought I had a fight with my husband. I told her I just felt terribly depressed. She said, I think it's time for you to go to church. So I went to church with her. The first gospel song I learned was, 
It's Jesus who drove away the darkness in my heart. It's Jesus who drove away the cold and sadness in my heart. From now on, I won't ask myself bitterly why I'm walking on such a rough path. Wow, who wrote this song? How come it was speaking right to me? I'm not a good singer, and I go off key all the time. But that night, I sang loudly. Miss Chan pulled the collar off my shirt and whispered to me, "Not so loud." Where everyone will sing off key. From Jesus' side, to say, his core message. The core message of Christianity is personal salvation. The key point is that your attitude towards life will completely change. You live in this world, and you might have all kinds of limitations imposed on you, but your spirit and salvation exist beyond this world. Liu Xiaofeng, a contemporary noted scholar, has persistently sought the truth of faith. I lectured in Zhongshan University last month. A student took up at the end of my lecture and said, "You are Christian. That makes you not Chinese. If you were Chinese, you wouldn't believe in Christianity. It's part of the Western culture." Well, accepting Christianity helps me solve questions of being human, and as I've mentioned many times, the questions of being human are above those of being Chinese. Before the liberation of China, it was believed that if one more Chinese became a Christian, there would be one fewer real Chinese. In other words, you were like a Westerner. However, now people believe that if one more Chinese becomes Christian, then one more Chinese is saved. In fact, there is one more real Chinese because he or she no longer smokes, gambles, uses drugs, commits crimes, or disturbs our society. Before I became a Christian, nobody ever talked to me about joining the Communist Party. But the third day after I became a Christian, the party secretary of our local branch came to ask me to consider joining the party. I told him I was a Christian. He said, "Well, Christians aren't bad at all. There are several elderly Christians working for me. They're all very nice people." I thank the Lord in my heart. The manager of the company came to talk to me one day. I hear you believe in God, but remember you are a Communist Party member. I said to him, "The party has treated me well, but I've been receiving blessings of peace and joy since I believed in Jesus. The party is good, but the Lord is better. I have no choice but to follow Him." When he saw nothing would change my mind, he asked me to resign from the party. For me, this was great because now I don't have to go to the party meetings or pay member fees. I can use all my time after work to worship our Lord with my brothers and sisters in Christ. I've been an accountant in my company for two years. Then one day, my company decided to start two books to keep records: one accurate for inner use and one order to fool the public. I struggled with myself all night, and then I asked the Lord, "Let me keep this job to the end of this month." But the Lord told me. You should stop doing it the moment you know is wrong. When I went to work the next Monday, the first thing I did was to go straight to my manager. I told him I couldn't do it. My company then asked me to resign, but I didn't, because the Lord didn't tell me to. My company didn't lay me off though; they transferred me to the maintenance department. I believe God is very powerful. Otherwise, He wouldn't have been able to transform the lives of my son and his wife. Their life used to be like oh, it's hard to describe. Anyway, let's just say it was a trashy, low life. It was a life I absolutely hated to see. Now they've been completely changed. They have become so wonderful. How can I not thank God? I have been to church four times. My son always asks me to go with him. He loves me. 
In spring, they couldn't find anyone who wanted to plant trees for the city. They had tried different government departments, but nobody wanted to do it. Then there was a Christian who gathered hundreds of brothers and sisters in no time at all. They grabbed their shovels and planted all the trees in the blink of an eye. While the local government chief was making a speech to praise them, the brothers told him, "You should thank the Lord." So the chief thanked the Lord. <laughs> The managers of the labor camps were very happy when Christians were brought in. They would say, "Great! Now we've got some prisoners who can be put in charge because Christians were the most trustworthy. They were often assigned jobs as keepers of personal belongings, supervisors of other prisoners, or group managers, or any jobs that required trust." The prison managers were sometimes very sad to see the Christians leave because they were such good people. Seven leaders in my labor camp came to see me the day I was released. They held my hands and said, "Lao Jing, we wish you could stay for three more years. We don't want to see you go." Then they told me to continue my faith after my release. Four of our camp leaders became Christians. We lived together and talk a lot. Before I was released, they told me, "If this were a better place, we would keep you here." We really don't want to let you go. The prison managers realized that the Christians were really good people. We were nicknamed free prisoners because we were put in charge of the vegetable garden and distributed the produce to the managers. The police officers went so far as to tell us that if everyone became Christian, then they would have nothing to do. To spread the gospel not only saves a person's soul, but also brings blessing to the entire society. It changes society. I found all my employees at church. I have 600 employees. They all attend Sunday services. So every Sunday, there are always more than 600 members in our four chapels. We have prayer time every morning and evening. We also have Bible study groups. Our cooperation is mainly in the restaurant business, but we also own some seawater fish farms and schools. For each business, we have a choir of 20 people. We sing gospel songs to our customers, and bring blessings to their lives. They like those songs. Each business of ours has a prayer box for customers. They write down their problems and put them in the box. Every week, we open the box and pray for them. We used to rely on our famous hospitality to be the main attraction of our business. Now we rely on Jesus Christ. Some customers didn't know who Jesus was. After they met the Lord here, they started to go to church. What makes me happy is to see our customers at church. Some other customers suggested we hire call girls and hook up karaoke machines at our restaurants. But I told them, no way. I felt very proud one day when one of our customers called home from our restaurant, and all he had to say to his wife was, "I'm at Huashu Ethnic Village, and I'll be home late." Just one simple sentence. But I was very touched. He probably used to give a lot of excuses to his wife, but when he called from my restaurant, no explanations needed and no questions asked, I felt this was a symbol of trust. A lot of us cried when we saw the news of flood on TV. Although most of us come from the northeast and have no family ties in the south, we still felt the pain. We got together and prayed. Our employees donated 135,000 yuan that night. The Lord loves me, and He commands us to love one another. I feel the love and warmth among people here. I no longer care how much money I make or how hard I work. I truly enjoy working here.
We have parent meetings every year, mainly to let them see what kind of life their children are living. After they see the changes in their children, they also want to know God. After they go back home, they start going to their local church. We began as a small private business in 1993. It's God's miracle that we've grown to be so huge and successful. Every day our restaurant is overwhelmed. Many people have asked me, how do you get this many people to come every day? And I said, I believe in God. I don't think of it like I'm running a business. It's more like I'm in the business of loving God. It is inevitable that we meet problems or disputes with our customers. But the first thing our employees do is pray. In tears, they pray before God. I also kneel before God and pray every day. And so do my employees. Lord, we would like you to use our young lives in your service. Amen. I used to ask the Lord for wealth, and now I only ask for one thing. Please use me as your tool. It will be the greatest blessing in my life. Three missionary leaders were born around the time the blood of Christian martyrs was shed in the Boxer Rebellion. Mingdao Wang, John Sung, and Watchman Ni. Mingdao Wang was born in Beijing in 1900. At age 20 he began his work as an evangelist. At 27 he established Spiritual Food Quarterly. In 1955, he was imprisoned for refusing to renounce his faith. While in prison, weakened by intense interrogation and torture, he was forced to sign a statement renouncing his faith. After his release, Ming Da Wang could not find inner peace. He gave himself up to the authorities and went back to jail with his wife this time for life. Twenty years later, in 1977, Mrs. Wang was released. Ming Dao Wang would rather die than accept his release. But two years later, the government tricked him into leaving. Although I live in darkness, the Lord is my light. I want to endure his wrath because I offended him. Ming Dao Wang and his wife passed away in 1991 and 
John Sung was born in 1901. In 1926, he studied in America and received his Ph.D. in chemistry, and then went on to the Union Theological Seminary of New York. The president of the seminary thought Song was crazy. He was locked up for 193 days. In the asylum, Song read the Bible 40 times. Later, on his way back to China, Song threw a golden key into the Pacific Ocean. It was the symbol of his Ph.D. In the following 17 years, John Sung, known as Crazy Sung, spread the gospel like wildfire across China and Southeast Asia. In 1944, when he was 43 years old, Sung passed away. Watchman Nee was born in 1902. From the time he was 28, he wrote a great deal both in Chinese and English. In Shanghai, he established a church known as the Local Small Group Church, and soon this form of church spread across the country. In 1952, he was convicted of counter-revolutionary activities and was imprisoned in Bai Mao Ling Jail. He died suddenly in 1972, just before the end of his prison term. All these men who were born during the Boxer Rebellion later became founders of Chinese Christian churches. During the late 20th century, no matter how fiercely the storms of persecution raged, Christianity could no longer be uprooted from China as it was in the Tang, Ming, and Qing dynasties. Instead, the faith flourished. It had grown too strong to be suppressed. From Matteo Ricci, Robert Morrison, and Hudson Taylor to the Boxer Martyrs of 1900, the seeds planted by the life and blood of thousands of Western missionaries finally had sent down deep roots into this harsh and ancient land. The Chinese Communist Party members who took control of mainland China in 1949 were die-hard atheists. Although the Constitution acknowledges freedom of religion, the Communist Party's covert goal is to limit, transform, and eventually eliminate religions. From 1949 to 1953, at least several thousand Christians were killed. Tens of thousands were imprisoned. While these horrors were happening, Premier Zhou Enlai invited Wu Yaotsung to a number of meetings. They launched the Three Self-Patriotic Movement. It urged Christians to join the government-controlled Three Self Church, which advocated self-governance, self-support, and self-propagation. Its aim was to put Christians under the complete control of the Communist Party. I was imprisoned because I refused to join the Three Self-Patriotic Movement. I love my country very much. My students are the best pianists in China. Some even went abroad to perform, and they were well received everywhere. I didn't break any laws. But the government wanted to denounce me anyway. The real reason was that I spread the gospel and refused to join the Three Self Church. I was a good friend of Wu Yaozong, the leader of the Three Self Movement. But I was surprised when he asked me to be part of the leadership. I refused. 
even though I knew my refusal would lead me to prison and labor camp. I considered all the consequences. Sure enough, on the evening of May 28, 1956, people from the police and public security came to take me away. On September 14, 1955, I was sent to prison for the first time. Sixteen months I spent there. In 1958, I was sentenced to 20 years. I wasn't released until 1978. The first time I was sent to jail was in 1960. The main charge was my refusal to join a three-self movement. Why would these evangelists rather be imprisoned than join the government-controlled three-self church? We believe that Jesus is the head of the church, not any person or organization. Politics and religion should be separate. When you try to integrate them, the church deteriorates and can become a political tool. They also had serious questions about the faith of Wu Yaotsung and other leaders of the three self churches. One day during a dinner conversation, I asked Wu Yaotsung what he thought about the miracles performed by Jesus. He said he had rejected those long ago. Wu Yaozhong and Ding Guanshun, they both belong to a faction which we called the non-believers group. We refused to join them because we felt they didn't have faith. Within 10 years, almost all the evangelists who refused to join the Three Self Church were imprisoned or put into labor camps. Madam Yang Xin Fei was one of them. She graduated from the Shanghai Music Academy in 1957 and was 27 when arrested. She spent 20 years in jail. The night she was arrested, her father was very ill. My dad was already in bed. I went to say goodbye to him. I also asked for my mother. We always pray before leaving home. There was one policeman standing guard beside her and another one beside me. My mother prayed to the Lord, begging him to take care of me. Have mercy on my daughter. Let her live peacefully and bring her back safe and sound. May the Lord be with her. Then I left home and went to the labor camp. During this harsh winter of faith, the land was frozen and bleak, but the wheat did not die. Underneath the ice and snow, seeds were struggling to take root, waiting for spring to come. I was in jail for 21 years and 8 months in Heilongjiang province, near the former Soviet Union. It was extremely cold there and a lot of people died. But you know, all those years I never got sick. Not only did I survive, I wasn't sick a single day. So I know God still has work for me to do. The hardest part was that all the women criminals were locked up in one room. And it was too noisy to sleep. I also need to pray every day or I can't sleep. So I waited until they all fall asleep and I crept up out of bed and kneeled and prayed to God. Every night was like this until I left the labor camp. I had to pull the blankets over my head and pray. There was no Bible, but a hymn stayed with me. You know the one? The old rugged cross. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. I sang it over and over to keep my spirits up. The path of the cross was paved with humiliation and suffering. For those who chose to walk this path, every step was taken with blood and tears. 
这样长的时间。我 I was in jail for twenty three years. If they had told me that it would last twenty three years, I don't think I would have made it. When they held a public meeting to criticize and denounce me, they asked, "Do you still believe in God? Do you still believe in Jesus?" They pulled my hair and my ears. They punched me, knocked me to the ground, and kicked me. And they jerked my handcuffs and asked, "Do you believe? Do you still believe?" The handcuffs had made deep gouges in my flesh, which had started to fester. They hauled me away like this, back and forth, back and forth. But I pray to the Lord, I have followed you as far as I can. Surely you're not glorified when they denounce and torture me each day. I'm your servant and your child. Are you glorified in heaven when I'm suffering like this? In prayer, I entrusted my whole family to the Lord. Then I was ready to kill myself. But how could I do it with handcuffs on? When the two guards went for lunch, I jumped onto the bed. And unscrewed the light bulb. I planned to kill myself with an electric shock, but the electricity wasn't strong enough. Later, people told me it was because I had handcuffs on. The handcuffs diverted the electricity and saved me. While I was in the middle of doing this, people from outside noticed and shouted, "Moses Shea wants to kill himself." The government officials called me out and lectured me. You want to threaten the government? You want to make the government look bad by killing yourself? At night, I confessed to God. I said, "Heavenly Father, I have fallen short of Your glory. I have made it through twelve years of labor camp, and endured a lot of suffering. Why couldn't I rely on You till the very end? I am not worthy of Your glory. Please forgive me, O Lord." Then I heard the Lord speak to me. Dear child, my grace is sufficient for you. Dear child, my grace is sufficient for you. And the third time he spoke so very gently, my grace is sufficient for you. The Lord comforted me, and by His grace I survived. While thousands of Christians suffered in prison for the sake of the cross, the storm outside the jails grew even stronger. After 1958, the government closed down many churches in the name of unifying them. Of the 66 churches in Beijing, only four remained open. In Shanghai, eight of 204 were left open, and in Guangzhou. Only one of the original 52 was left. All of a sudden, it seems that the Chinese Church was withering. In 1966, when the Cultural Revolution started, the Chinese Christian Church faced extermination. Priests were denounced. Churches were destroyed. Believers' homes were confiscated, and Bibles were burned. Even the three self churches did not escape. Chairman Mao's wife claimed that Chinese Christianity was finished and belonged in the history museum. What do you say? Where are you going? All are holy. Everywhere you went, there were red guards. Everywhere you went, there were armed radicals. Everywhere they interrogated you. Many faithful believers shed tears in secret while they waited and waited for light to come. I remember clearly on June 16th, 1966, the largest poster they put out read, "Down with the imperialist running dog, missionary Zhang Yupei." I said. I cannot change my belief in Jesus. They replied, "You stubborn idiot! Go see your God." All the students came to the meeting, criticized and denounced me. From then on, they locked me in a cow shed. I remember watching a Christian standing on a platform. They denounced him and called him a ringleader of superstitious people. There was an elderly sister in our area. 
And when she got on the platform, she called out, Believe in Jesus. Do not fear death. I was convicted of counter-revolutionary activities because of my faith in Jesus. I was forced to parade through the streets. They often held public meetings to denounce me. My whole family suffered the same thing, just because they were related to me. Many churches were shut down. Missionaries were arrested or forced to wear tall dunce caps. Their hands were painted black, and they were forced to parade through the streets. Church life was completely destroyed. At the same time, an idol landed on God's altar. When Mao Zedong stood overlooking Tiananmen Square and waved to the fanatic masses below, it seemed that he had captured the heart and soul of everyone in China. Dear Chairman Mao, we promise you we will be the successors of the working class revolutionary mission. We will follow you and carry out revolution all our lives. We will smash the old world and build a new world for the working class. The imperialists and revisionists hoped in vain to transform us and in future generations peacefully. But that will never happen. We will take the great thoughts of Mao Zedong and carry them to the next generation and spread them all over China and the world. But underneath the overpowering waves stirred up by this mighty hurricane, real Christians remained clear-minded and held on to their faith. German Mao's portrait was larger than life. We were forced to kneel and confess before it. I refused to kneel and stood there, wobbling from one side to the other one. People shouted, and the dog kept barking and biting us. Officials brought out scissors and cut off my hair. I lay on the ground, but did not kneel before them. Whether we studied current affairs or the quotations of Chairman Mao, I kept silent. I refused to sing revolutionary songs, not a single line. I refused to salute, long live Chairman Mao. I refused to raise my fist to show my loyalty. I refused to write statements that promised obedience. They interrogated me, Moses Shea. Answer this question. Can Chairman Mao go to heaven? This was a tough question. If I said Chairman Mao couldn't go to heaven, they would beat me to death on the spot. It was a life or death moment. During that time, I had been praying day and night. I spent all my time in prayer and got very little sleep. So I stood up, handcuffed, and said, The door to heaven is wide open. Everyone can enter as long as he acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, was crucified on the cross, that His blood can cleanse all our sins, and admits He is a sinner and is willing to receive Jesus as Savior. Then He can enter the gates of heaven. The gate of grace is wide open. Now is the time for salvation. I am only too anxious to see you all repent and receive Jesus and His grace. The government commissar stepped down from the platform and hit me angrily. Moses Shea, you are preaching again. I said, you all asked me to speak. Could I have refused to answer your question? This elderly man, Mr. Tsai, was put in jail during the Cultural Revolution. He was accused of opposing Chairman Mao. I didn't put up Chairman Mao posters because at the time, Chinese people worship Mao as their god, and I believe Jesus is the only true god. The government held a public meeting. About 10,000 people were gathered to denounce me. When they asked me to confess, the first words out of my mouth were, For God so loved the world. <laughs> With the death of Chairman Mao in 1976, the nationwide movement to deify him, which had been disastrous for the Chinese nation, 
finally came to an end. In 1977, house church services, conducted in the homes of the faithful, started to spring up in cities and throughout the countryside. Every day, people used to gather in this empty square in Shanghai People's Park to pray together. Soon, a number of three self churches also opened up. People quickly discovered that Christianity had not died in China. In fact, even during those traumatic times. Faith in Christ had been spreading in miraculous ways. Liu Yuanpo was a village teacher from Hunan Province, and as a young man, traveled to Beijing to attend Chairman Mao's review of Red Guards. Those of us who went to Beijing were excellent students. After returning home from Beijing, I was appointed Red Guard Commander. During the time, we were so ignorant. All we wanted was to live and die for Chairman Mao. Until the day I die, I'll never forget what happened when an old missionary was denounced. In fact, I was directly involved in organizing the public meeting and scheming how to accuse and punish her. But when the Red Guards beat her up, she responded kindly, "Oh God, forgive these children, for they don't know what they're doing." In 1978, I repented. And my wife and I started a house church in our home. At first, only a few old ladies attended. Now we have over 3,000 believers. The first training school began at my house. Today, there are between 40 and 50 training schools like this. We are the children of God. But they say we are the descendants of dragon. Wang Shenzai, who is now a house church leader, was once a Red Guard commander. In order to show his loyalty to Chairman Mao, he persecuted his own mother because of her belief in Jesus. Because I was an activist in the Cultural Revolution, I put up a big poster to criticize my mother publicly. I didn't want to have anything to do with her. Especially politically, it didn't matter that she was my mother. In spite of what I did, she prayed for me and fasted for 20 days. This made me think: if something were definitely bad for them, a mother would not want her children to have anything to do with it. Why did she pray and fast for 20 days for my salvation? I had to think about that. She would risk her own life so that her child might come to believe in Jesus, while the same Jesus was denounced, convicted, and labeled as evil by our country. I was wondering, but couldn't figure out why. One day, my second sister came home and asked me if I'd like to read a book. Yes, I said. In those days, I welcomed any books. Later, she gave me a book that had no cover and no back. It was worn out all the way to the seventh chapter of Matthew. The moment I started reading it, I was moved. In chapter seven, it said, "Do not judge, or you will be judged. Whatever measure you use to give to others, the same measure will be given 
to you. This is so true, true, I thought. When I asked my sister who wrote it and told her it was so well written, she thought I had already accepted Jesus. She said they were Jesus' words. I was furious. I threw the book out into the yard. That hurt my sister so much, worse than a wound. She rushed outside and picked up the Bible. Then she told me that a sister in Christ had died during the Cultural Revolution in order to save this Bible. Wang Xinsai's sister brought a Christian to see him. Later, this brother died in jail. I invited him into my room. When he saw all the books on my desk, he asked me if I had read them all. I said that I had. Then he said, you must be a seeker of truth. I said, yes. He told me that I wouldn't be able to find truth on earth. Real truth comes from above. He gave me an example. There was an apricot tree laden with ripe yellow fruit that fell to the ground. A pig came by and ate the apricot. Afterwards, the pig dug at the earth with his snout to try to find more. It didn't know to look up and see that the apricot had come from above. I thought the story was very philosophical. He didn't mention Jesus at all or anything about the Bible. Later on, I felt an explosive force within me and said, I believe. After I said that, I felt my face turn red. The blush was hotter than being caught stealing. After becoming a believer, Wang Xinsai was eager to find the Bible he had thrown away, and he did manage to track down the Bible's owner. I said I'd like to trade my bicycle for your old Bible. I offered my new Pigeon brand bicycle, but he said no. In those years, a brand new bicycle cost as much as a car does today. However, a Bible was an invaluable treasure for a Christian. The church was shut down, and from 1958 on, there were no gatherings. But an elderly sister fasted, prayed, and cried out to the Lord every day. She cried for the future of the Chinese church. During the Cultural Revolution, they found the Bible in her house and took her away. They beat her and broke one of her feet. There was only one torn apart Bible that survived the Cultural Revolution within 50 miles of our home. It had the New Testament, but only from Romans chapter 12 to Revelation chapter 11. We wanted to study it, but the owners wouldn't lend it out. It was their treasure. So we had to go over there to copy it. Every week, we had to make two or three trips. The first Bible I received was from a sister. Someone from Hong Kong had given it to her. During our meeting, we passed it around so that everyone could touch and feel it for a while. Everybody held it to their cheeks and kissed it. After being kissed by 30 people, the Bible was soaked with tears and the red color became faded. During the Cultural Revolution, Chinese Christians risked their lives to preserve a few Bibles. But toward the end, a lot of hand-copied Bibles became available. And overseas believers began to smuggle Bibles to house churches across the country. It was not until 1985, sponsored by a Western foundation, that Bibles were printed in China in large quantities. But even today, public distribution is not permitted. People who want to own a Bible must buy one at a three-self church. Mountains cannot stop rivers that flow to the ocean. Today, the Bible has entered millions of Chinese families. It is a stream in the desert moistening every thirsty soul.
By the end of the 1970s, Christians began to be released from jail. I was so anxious to go home. I wasted no time and took the express train. It was after 11 o'clock at night when the train arrived in Beijing. Our eldest daughter and her husband, our third son and I, the four of us, quickly ate some porridge, then hurried to the train station. The light was red and dim. You could hardly see anything. Our eyes got very tired. The four of us were spread out along the platform. We couldn't see each other. We kept looking around the train station until no one was left. We didn't find him. I'd been gone over 20 years and I was wearing a black cotton padded jacket and pants and a big fur hat and a pair of boots. They couldn't see me. Alan Yuan took the bus to Bai Tassa, to the home he had left, but he couldn't find his home. I looked here and there. Where should I go? I started to call my wife's name, Lili Liang. I didn't know where she had moved. In 1958, we were at Huyen Chong. Their new address, I had no idea. My third daughter-in-law answered my call. Lili Liang went to the train station to pick someone up. I replied that it was me. Remember, I had never met any of these daughters-in-law. My oldest son was only 17 when I left. Mrs. Yuan, along with her children, came back from the train station very disappointed. I saw a light in my room. Was it possible? I hurried up the steps and opened the door. There he was washing his feet. His head was shaven, and he was quite happy. I was speechless. He told me they gave him 60 yuan for traveling. I still couldn't say a word. He was so thin. I didn't know what to say, yet I was full of joy and gratitude. Usually, if it was a life sentence, you could never go home. People who don't believe in Jesus said a strong fate must have helped me return home. It wasn't my fate. I am God's child. The first thing we did was to thank God. It was beyond every hope I ever had that he might come home. It turned out that prison was a safe place to be during the Cultural Revolution. Otherwise, he would have been beaten to death. I was so full of gratitude when I thought of this. After he washed his feet, he didn't eat. He went right to sleep. I cleaned up and got ready to go to work the next day. Twenty years of imprisonment were over, but Alan Yuan knew that his wife had had a harder life outside prison during those long years. All those twenty years, when I was gone, my wife suffered a lot while she raised our children. After he left, we had eight people in the family, my mother-in-law and six children. I had no job. Later, when I got a job, I made eighty cents a day which is 24 yuan, U.S. $3 a month. After the 3 yuan tithe, I had 21 yuan left. How could the eight of us live on so little money? All I could do was pray, Lord, yes, this is from you, so I won't say anything about it. I just want to ask you to protect my children and me from dishonoring you. None of my six children complained. I often told them that their father went to jail not because of any crime, but my children did suffer a lot. One of my sons, he was nicknamed Cornbread Head because that was the lunch he brought to school every day. He said, Mother, could you buy me a wheat roll just once to shut it up? I said I couldn't. If I just bought one roll, it was not fair for the other kids, and I couldn't afford to buy six. One day, this family of eight hit rock bottom. There was absolutely nothing left to eat. It was late, about 11 o'clock, and I pray, Oh, Lord, we have nothing for tomorrow. No rice, no flour no money. Lord, if you don't provide, all we have is water. But early the next morning, someone knocked on the door. I had just finished my prayers, so I opened the door right away. 
It was an elderly woman in her sixties. I didn't know her, so I asked her name. She said, "Please don't ask my name. The Holy Spirit brought me here." She said, "Here is something for you." It was a package. I opened it. After she left, it was fifty yuan, which was a lot of money then. So I was able to buy flour, coal, and food. One day, a girl came to the Yuan family with three packages. She said, "The big bag you can send to Uncle Yuan. The middle-sized bag is for you to give to others in need, and the little bag is to be used for your expenses." My child, what is your name? I ask. She said, "Please don't ask. Mother didn't want me to tell you." During those difficult twenty years, it was this great love that came from above and from those around her that sustained this gentle woman and her family in body and heart. It was amazing. Each time the money came in the mail with a code name, one zero seven eight or one zero five six, I would write back. I have received the money and hope to meet you soon. I don't know you, but thank you for your gift of love. Two days later, my letter was returned. The post office, noting that there was no such person, money was sent every month for over twenty years. Some people, like my neighbors, say, "How come you are still joyful after going through so much suffering?" They don't understand, but I do. My Lord strengthened me. In 1978, Pastor Samuel Lam was released from prison. When I got out of jail, I found out that my wife had died two years earlier. My father died seven years earlier. When I returned from labor camp, I had nothing left. They didn't return any of my assets or my house. They came to our home three times to confiscate things. Finally, they kicked us out. We had to live in a little dark room, about seven square meters. There was no daylight, no fresh air. 
Perhaps they didn't anticipate that the pressures that they had to face after leaving jail hadn't changed. They still had to register to join the Three South Church. But the government also had an unanticipated situation to deal with. The answers from all these Christians remain the same as before. I refuse to register. That's what I said. Go ahead and arrest me again. I was 75 in 1999. I am an old man. I'm used to jail. The first time I was in prison for 16 months. The second time, 20 years. I'm used to it. When I returned home in October 1979, people came to my house every day. Some came to read the Bible. Some came to pray. Later we started the house church service and we continue to this day. My faith is more important than everything else. If the laws of the government are against my faith, I will never submit to man. I submit to God. I was not against the government. The government misunderstood me. According to the Bible, we submit to the authorities. But in terms of faith, I submit to God, not man. That's all. They continue holding on to their faith and continue to carry their own cross. Between October 10, 1985 to January 10, 1986, they locked me up for three months. And again, between April 24 and July 23, 1992, they put me behind bars for three months, accusing me of spreading the gospel outside of pre-assigned area. The plainclothes policeman came on Sunday and declared there was no service on that day. They claimed Yuan was sick. In the middle of the gathering, seven public security personnel entered in uniform. Three of them went upstairs and stood at the stairway. One of them interrupted our preaching and asked who reported to the police that there had been a suicide. One of the brothers said no one had reported any suicides. We didn't have any suicides here. Then we started to sing, the cross, the cross. We were singing as they left. These elderly men who had been deprived of their youth, who were even considered strange in the modern world, showed neither bitterness nor regret. The first time they asked me if I was going to appeal, I said no. I thought to myself, why appeal to man? All I need is pray to God. We shouldn't resent anybody because nothing happened that came from man. God allowed us to suffer this way. Jesus suffered as well, but was not resentful. He prayed for his persecutors. After I was released, I didn't appeal. The policeman said, we're not going to redress your case because you will keep doing the same thing. Of course I will keep doing the same thing. I've been put on this earth to witness for the Lord. What else is important? Didn't the Lord tell me from the beginning to give up everything and carry the cross to follow Him? This is the Lord's way. I'm following Him on the same path. Why should I be upset? Why should I complain? This is my biggest blessing. Epaphras was originally sentenced to life imprisonment, but they released him in 1987. It was very important to him not to leave the Yinchuan jail, so he stayed in a little house nearby. The court cheated me and changed my situation from non-repentant to repentant in order to release me. I protested in two ways. First, I refused to leave the jail. Then after I was released, I chose to live as a life sentence prisoner in a place just outside of the gates. Not only did he live next to the jail, Epaphras insisted on fasting five days a week. 
If I keep on fasting like this, they will know I have not repented, that I don't accept their accusations in the first place. If I continue to fast like this until I die, it will mean that I refuse repentance even until death. After 15 years of fasting. Epaphras came to the end of his seventy-eight years on this earth and rested in the Lord. Some churches in Yinchuan wanted to have some of his ashes, but they were quietly spread on the Yellow River. In his last letter to his relatives, Epaphras wrote, "I died as an unrepentant criminal, just like my Lord Jesus." For many years, I have believed in Jesus and followed Him. The Lord Jesus has always listened to my prayers. He has been with me wherever I go. I will never deny Him. Cross surpasses all human understanding. The way of the cross is the way of humiliation and glory, the way of suffering and joy, the way of sacrifice and victory. In Shaman, Madame Yang Xinfei leads a house church that consists mainly of college students. She also preaches in the nearby cities and villages. In Shanghai and Beijing, Pastor Moses Xu devotes his advanced years to reaching out to the increasing number of younger people who have thirsty souls. In Guangzhou, Pastor Samuel Lam and his Damajan House Church stand firm and with grace in all their trials and hardships. Before I went to jail, we had 400 people. After I came back, we had 900. They confiscated the house in 1990. After that, we grew to 2,000. The third floor was not big enough. So we had to use closed-circuit TV on the second floor. Finally, we had to use the basement as well. The more they persecuted, the more blessed we became. Today, the church has moved to Rungguili, where every day is like a holiday, and groups of Christians gather together in joy. In Beijing, Pastor Alan Yuan's house church is like a lighthouse, beaming out the hope of Chinese Christians into the dark night. Every summer, Alan Yuan, who is now 90, Baptizes hundreds of people.
God called me to spread the gospel and serve the Lord. In my heart, I accept the vision from above. Even though we are limited in many ways, the devil will never conquer the church. Battles like this raged in the past. Today, the Lord's work marches forward in China, just like the time of Acts.